Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. G'day, welcome back to the Australian Property Podcast. This week, I'm delighted to have a very special guest, Dr. Cameron Murray. Cam, welcome. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having me, Pete. So Cameron is a, an economist, if you're not familiar, corruption and property markets specialist. And uh, the reason I've uh, followed Cam's work over the years is because he's an independent thinker. So um, don't always have to agree with everything he says, but um, he will challenge the status quo. And he's a guy who reckons economics could be better. Um, currently postdoctoral research fellow uh, at the University of Sydney, but Cam also wrote the book on political favoritism in Australia, Game of Mates, uh, which you can check out at gameofmates.com. But also, Cam, I understand you've got another book coming out relatively soon on housing, which is very topical. <laughs> yeah, just working away now, putting all my thoughts together after a couple of decades, both uh, participating in the housing market, uh, writing about it and, and doing research. So that, that should be out at the start of 2024, uh, a book on housing that should change the way a lot of people think about things. And there's never any shortage of stuff to talk about when it comes to <laughs> Aussie property. Uh, so one of the key themes I wanted to explore with you today is why we don't build enough houses. We always hear this stuff in the media. Brisbane is running out of land, which seems kind of a paradoxical. Uh, and then mm. we seem to go from one shortage to the next crisis. Um, so just to rewind the clock a little bit, I obviously grew up in Great Britain. I remember one of my junior school teachers saying to us, actually, just buy the biggest house you can afford because there's a real shortage of land, uh, which I think in if you look at London and the southeast of England, there's all the green belt land that you can't build on. You know, it kind of made sense. And the population is snowballed to about 80 million on a small island. Um, but I've come to Australia. This is a vast country. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems kind of absurd to be sitting here talking about shortages and not enough land available. <laughs> so um, can you explain yeah. to me why why is that the case? Why don't we have enough houses? Yeah, uh, well, I guess my position would be we do have enough houses. Uh, the shortage uh, idea that keeps cropping up, and let me tell you, this is not new. This is not some kind of 2023 post-COVID thing. If you go back to the 1830s, you can read in Charles Darwin, the famous biologist uh, whose theory of evolution changed things radically. When he visited Sydney in 1830, he said, uh, I can't believe how grand the new homes are and how much space there is, yet everyone's complaining, complaining about the high rents and the shortage of housing. And then if you look at newspapers from Brisbane in the 1840s, they talk about the shortages and all these foreigners coming in and buying up land in the city for astronomical prices. And the question there well, has to be, well, in the 1840s in Queensland, there are only 10 or 15,000 people, right? <laughs> so the idea that, that there was some kind of physical shortage just never entered um, this sort of serious discussion. It was always acknowledged that, well, private property rights create a monopoly and those who don't own property rights get squeezed because there's no uh, mechanism to force property owners to flood the market and build houses and invest in things. And so we see this repeat every cycle for 200 years. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of research for this book I'm writing and uh, I've gone to a lot of archives looking at old new old books old reports or old newspaper clippings and pretty much every decade uh since since the first colony in australia uh there's been a housing shortage right uh and and so i guess if if you're going to look at it through that lens the question is well okay if it's not a shortage what what is it and my answer to that is it's simply well when you have a property monopoly you're going to end up paying the monopoly price 
And at different points in the cycle, it means prices will adjust quickly or slowly. And when they adjust quickly, we all get upset. And so if we think about, for example, what's happening in the rental markets around the world right now. So you would have read the newspaper headings, every, headlines every day in Australia. It's the rental shortage, the rental shortage. Yet it's still the case that there are more dwellings per capita, bigger and better than at any point in human history in Australia right now. Right. So the idea that it's something related to the physical objects of houses and the physical number of people and not the distribution of ownership of those houses and the distribution of incomes of people who are trying to bid against each other, I think is a huge uh, mistake. And it really distracts you from what's going on. Um, we can sort of um, dig that, dig into that a bit further and see that the occupancy rate of housing has fallen, right? So how can it, we have fewer people per houses if there, were, if there was a shortage, right? Surely if there's a shortage, we should have more and more people per dwelling because we aren't building enough houses, yet the opposite's the case. There's right? some amazing uh, resources out there. You mentioned um, Parliamentary Library, National Libraries Australia. That's and right. you're right, every time I you know, do some uh, digging, into those articles, it's almost like they could have been written yesterday. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's um, shortage of housing, negative gearing, young people being locked out of the market. It's like uh, it's like the same issues, just um, the words might be in a slightly different order. Yeah. And um, so you're right. So on the, the rental crisis issue, so I pick up the the morning news, and then here in Dublin, there's nothing for rent. Same in London, but also places like. Portugal or Hong Kong, hmm. Australia. So this is clearly not just an Aussie issue. Now, one of the things that I did pick up from the Reserve Bank is that previously we had a lot of people in share housing, um, maybe students um, and new arrivals and so on. And then I think during the pandemic period where there are all kinds of crazy restrictions on what you could and can't do, or you could and couldn't do, people just um, gave up on the idea of share housing. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. moved outwards, potentially, That's right. look, uh, to regional areas, getting more space and fresh air. Um, so I guess is that, that's that been one of the factors, I guess, a change in the way that people have lived rather than a change in that, that balance of the number of houses. Well, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, if you remember 2020 and 2021, actually rents... I try not to. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember, but, but I try not to. But people fled to the regions, right? They fled to the lifestyle towns and rents went up there. And no one said, oh, it's a shortage. We knew that it was this change in the number of people demanding it. Essentially, we had high-income people come to outbid the low-income people who were there and basically kick them out of those of those places. It's the same pattern that we see in the trendy hipster suburbs that gentrify, right? High income people come in, um, low income people get get bid out and, and pushed elsewhere. So we saw that as a flight to the regions. Now we're seeing that in reverse as people return to the cities. But what we've seen is this household formation, we call it. We've seen record first home buying. People forget uh, that in 2021 and 2022, we had about double the typical amount of first home buying in Australia. So despite all the press you heard about the, the how hard it is for first home buyers, and I recall a, uh, a Four Corners um, expose that I was part of uh, at the end of, uh, it, was, it was late last year, I believe, uh, going on about how difficult it was for first home buyers. It was, the truth was that first home buying was at record highs, right? Because people were forming new households they were using their superannuation and their extra incomes from from COVID, and they were just saying well i can't spend on a holiday i can save all this money now i, I can bring forward buying a house um and so so that's what we saw and now we're seeing sort of the rush back to the cities and i think a lot of people um can't quite understand that rental growth rates, so how quickly rents are changing, can be at record highs, while the level of rents compared to incomes is not. Because between 2017 and 2019, I don't know if you remember, but there were headlines in the press, double whammy for landlords, rents falling and prices falling, right? That was a after the Royal Commission in 2017. That's what, what happened. Rents fell and prices fell for a couple of years. Then we had COVID, then rents fell even further in those inner city 
um, suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne, especially where there's a lot of foreign students. Uh, and now, oh, well, they've gone up 30%. Well, yeah, if they went down 20% over a four-year period and now went up 30%, they're actually not even 10% higher than they were five or six years ago, right? And if we were just adjusting back to the normal sort of rent-to-income ratios, that's that's what we'd see. And so we that's what we're, we're sort of seeing worldwide in the cities. Uh, I know Spain's just introduced new rent controls and and having governments um, take ownership of vacant properties that are still owned by banks after the financial crisis 15 years ago um, to, to create uh, sort of more available uh, space for renters. But, but I, I really see it as a return to normal type adjustment that's happening everywhere. So it does make intuitive sense. So if you took a place like... Um let's say Byron Bay or Noosa Heads. I mean, rents did go a bit bonkers there because there's to some degree a limited supply of where people want to live and it just people just flock to those areas. But I think if you took a generic unit or apartment in somewhere, particularly Sydney and Melbourne, as you mentioned, um, somewhere you know relatively close to the, the CBD area, I dare say the rents haven't changed that much over a, a five-year period. And in many cases, we've seen actually prices haven't budged maybe for a best part of a decade. So I think there's definitely um, some of that going on where prices or rent fell and then went back up. And I, I think um, yeah. Yeah, your point is interesting there. So it's really household formation is really the important thing. Um, and to some degree, the demand can change a lot quicker than the supply would adjust, um, which is why we might see these ups and downs through the cycle. Um, we might come back later in the piece to immigration and what the sort of the right level mm -hmm. of immigration might be because i guess one of the things uh, especially as a migrant myself who's kind of aware that we tend to like bringing in under 30s in australia so there's a lot of people in that um, early household formation cohort or first home buyers um but if the um we've got shortages i guess of the types of properties that people want to live in or want to rent in some areas anyway so i guess what are the what are the challenges around housing supply that stops us supplying more? You've already, I guess, alluded to some of yeah. it. There's no, not much incentive to flood the market. Yeah, I, th I think that's... So the, you've got to think about supply as two different things. So one is the incentive to occupy a dwelling. So, so there's... I think it's worth remembering that we couldn't have had all that household formation unless we had a lot of empty houses, right? So... You got to keep in mind. You can't just, you know, if there's no empty houses and there's 2.5 people per house, you can't just make it 2.4 people, right? There has to be a bunch of empty houses for people to spread into. So, we we often use the word supply to mean the number of dwellings that physically exist, and we often also use it to mean the number of dwellings currently advertised for for sale or for rent. And I think we need to sort of. Um, Keep in mind that they're slightly different. Now, um, in terms of the stock of physical dwellings, what I find puzzling about the debate is there is a sort of bipartisan consensus that we should build more houses. Okay, let's build more houses. With the with the obvious policy of let's have a public home builder, like we have a public road builder. <laughs> right or or any other public parks you know we don't go oh there's not enough public parks let's just cross our fingers and hope some property owner decides to convert their land into a park right we don't do that we say hey if we want them we build them yet with housing supply we we do the opposite we say oh we really need more houses but we the last thing we can do is actually build them and um and i find that really puzzling um because if it's true what property owners and the lobbyists say that you just got to upzone, remove regulations, and don't worry, we'll flood the market with supply. If that were true, seriously, the shareholders should get rid of all these directors from these companies because that's irresponsible. That is going to increase competition and decrease the price of their product. If you look at the pharmacy lobbyists, they don't say deregulate to make, you know, pharmaceuticals cheaper they say oh we need to be protected from competition to support you know the the well-being of our customers you can't let supermarkets sell pharmacy pharmaceuticals uh the taxi industry says the same thing yet suddenly the property industry says no worries i'll do it and 
I guess at the bottom, at the heart of this, and the reason why we have the same argument for two hundred years, is that property ownership is a monopoly, right? Just like a taxi license register is a monopoly, so is the register of titles, a list of people who own the monopoly rights to the space, and their business is not in making their product cheaper. So that's kind of why we see it. Now, here's a really interesting um, tidbit from my research. Um, after the Second World War in the United States, when there was a big push for public housing, <clears throat> the property owners got together and lobbied against it. They said that's unfair competition for building houses. And the only way we will accept a public home builder is if you knock down a slum home for a household for every one public home that you build so that you will not compete with us to bring down prices. Now that seems a bit more honest to me about, about the mechanisms of housing supply. And if we also look historically, the, the only real time we, we got expanded home ownership uh, and what I might call a golden age of housing is when governments really did flood the market and offer home ownership to many people. Um, so, you know, I'm an economist. I don't wanna say we have to have public intervention. I like to say we can let markets work. But I've been looking into this for decades, and I just really can't find any examples where that's happened. So that does that raises a really interesting question then of what role should the government play in housing and supply? You mentioned um, post-war. I certainly know in Britain there was a big uh, push of uh, public housing after the Second World War. Scandinavia had some massive um, public housing projects, right. you know, delivering millions of homes. Uh, via the government. Uh, but then we saw a switch around, I guess, uh, when I was a, a youngster growing up, we had Reaganomics and then uh, Margaret Thatcher in Britain had the what they called the stakeholder economy. They wanted people to own uh, parts of the mm -hmm. economy and they sold off the, the council houses at a discount to anybody who wanted to buy their council home. Now, in Australia, we, uh, we look at the public sector housing approvals each month and yeah, they go up and down a bit, but basically the trend is just down and down and mm. then more down. Now, we did have a bit of a boost during the Rudd stimulus in the financial crisis, but there's just no, it seems no appetite for governments to spend money on uh, public housing. Uh, we see sort of tinkering around the edges with things like the Housing Australia Future Fund. Um, but why, why don't governments get involved? Is it simply a cost thing trying to balance the budget? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm going to answer that in a second. But first, I want to sort of make clear that um, when we're talking about housing supply and, and the private market, for two thirds of households, the market works totally fine, right? Two thirds are homeowners, the, the top, you know, a third are renters, and, and most renters are doing fine as well. Right, so we're talking about a small uh, proportion of, of households who really um, struggle with housing. Um, and you're right that I think we've talked ourselves into into a situation where it's it's just implausible that a government could do something about housing, and we end up with all these tricks. Like I just saw the Queensland Greens announce they want to have inclusionary zoning, where one in every four new dwellings must be given for free to the state by a property owner doing a subdivision or an apartment development now that's kind of you know that's not going to happen um just just the it's a misreading of of the feasibility of of building new housing and it's a misreading of the politics in my view um so it is a puzzle that we've convinced ourselves to not build houses but pretend we can regulate to make other people build the houses we want at the price we want Right. I, I remember working. Um, I remember working in the Queensland regulator at a, and going to a conference where we all said, "No, we should privatise uh, the rail network." Um, and what we'll do is we'll regulate it so that they all have the right incentives to build the right new, new tracks and not waste money and do this. I'm like, hang on a minute. If you knew what these incentives were and how to regulate it, you don't need to privatise it. You just need to enact the thing that you already know how to do. Right. You either you do know how to do it and you don't need to privatize it or you don't know how to do it and you're hoping that there are market incentives that provide some guidance. It, it can't be both. And I think that's a little bit the case in housing. We've sort of convinced ourselves we don't know how to do it, but we also know how to do it perfectly enough to regulate other people to do it. And so... <laughs> um, 
you can think of these inclusionary zoning rules. Um, you can think of the Housing Australia Future Fund. And I don't know if your listeners will be familiar. It's the latest and greatest uh, Labor Party policy. I won't say greatest. It's the latest. Um, so I'll, let me just describe what that is. It's basically taking $10 billion that we magically have, by the way, that is just sitting around waiting to be spent and we're not going to build houses with it. What we're going to do is we're going to give it to the future fund. And what they're going to do is they're going to buy BHP shares, Apple shares, treasury bonds, and whatever else, listed financial assets. And then we're going to cross our fingers. And then we're going to hope that these go up in value. And if they go down, well, we've just lost money on, the, on our investment. But if it goes up, with a little bit of luck, in a few years' time, we'll have this margin, this difference between what it cost us to borrow the money and what we got. And we're going to take that margin and we're going to tell a future minister, it's up to you if you want to do anything with housing. Spend money or don't spend money, it's up to you. But if you want to spend, here's a $500 million limit. Like it's, it's, that's my sort of lay person's description. And you know, if that seems like a bit of a joke to you, then I think you've understood it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> when you put it like that, that's, uh, it does sound completely uh, crazy. Not, not least that the money has come from thin air but even just um running through those numbers so so for the sake of argument somebody does um have a a gain in the fund and we've got 500 million dollars i mean my understanding of the cost to build housing that's not going to really be moving the needle much no when you think about the cost of actually delivering a new dwelling to the market actually on that point i saw an interesting yeah. uh, graph this week from Dr. Alex Joyner of IFM Investors, and um, he calls it the new dwelling investment deflator ratio of domestic mm. financial demand deflator, uh, new dwelling prices. Let's not get bogged down in the terminology. Mm. Long story short, since 1960, the cost of building a house has gone up way more than inflation. Now, yeah. uh, my wife used to work at um, Lendlease on the Barangaroo project, and I, I can understand if you're building a block of units in an established area close to the city. I actually do understand why prices have gone up. It's, it's phenomenally complex these days. You've got hmm. site clearance, decontamination. Sometimes the developers have to provide infrastructure, all the rest of it. And also the units are better than they used to be. But yep. on the other hand, um, now this is a question you might be able to answer for me. Shouldn't just building a project home, to my understanding of ec economics, shouldn't it actually just get cheaper in real terms now you know i can't understand why the cost of building a new home would have gone up yes i guess on average they could be bigger um but is it wages is it so, the cost of yeah, materials yeah. is it something else because the price has just gone up and up as far as i can see that's right so i think you know as a rule of thumb probably half of it is quality improvement right so like i live in a house that was built in 1884 and and basically it's a pile of sticks right and you can go, hey, that was what a house was. No one would live in it. A house with no power, no plumbing, no insulation, no glass. I mean, like, you know, a 50 square meter house, you know, on, on you know, eight stumps on a block of mud is not going to cut it. Um, so, yeah, a lot of it's to do with that. The second point, you're right. Because a lot of the cost is labor, you've got a bit of a case of Bumal's cost disease. Now, I'm not sure if William Bumal was a famous economist who basically said, um, productivity gains in the economy result in higher wages because, um, for example, you can make music recording cheap and you can have all these gains, but the cost of going to, you know, the same number of people need to perform at the orchestra. And those people have the option of working in highly productive sectors. So to attract them to the orchestra, you need to pay them more money. So the cost of labor intensive services rises relative to manufactured products. So that's B William Bumal's uh, argument, and, and we sort of see that everywhere, right? Com yeah, the price of manufactured products falls compared to the pr price of human services. Now, the reason this is important in housing is because housing markets, it's very difficult to justify investments in prefabrication and standardization and you know, the, the manufacturing base you need when every site is different, right? So we want that flexibility. And plus, the industry is very cyclical. So if you think, well, next year I might have no jobs, I want to have all contractors, right? I don't want to have employees because the industry is cyclical. 
um, that's also uh, inhibits investment in large scale sort of prefabrication. And so the times where we do get big changes in prefabrication are, for example, in post-war Australia, where the government essentially guaranteed um, housing loans and, a, and, and provision of land that was suitable for prefabricated homes. And we see it, for example, today in Singapore, where they're onto the th third or fourth generation of prefabricated uh, construction techniques called pre pre precast volumetric construction. Essentially, it's truck-sized cubes of prefabricated building that, that essentially get stacked up like Lego. And they can do that because they get 20,000 of those every year, year in, year out, <laughs> guaranteed um, supplier, who, uh, guaranteed customer is not going to go broke to justify some of those capital investments. So I think construction, you know, it's a product of Bamal's cost disease, it's a product of houses getting better, and it's a product of the, the cyclicality and the variation geographically of where where that housing demand is that makes it very hard to automate and, and streamline um, you know, production, even though we do have a lot of good materials and, and, and nifty techniques coming into the sector. That's well explained. Uh, I guess you're right, in, particularly in a city like Brisbane, it's quite obvious when you see some of the older housing stock, you're not really comparing like with like because the difference in quality has changed. And also we live in much bigger houses than the old uh, 90 square meter Queenslanders these days. Um, yeah, that's right. I, I think one of the things, whenever we get an increase in rents or property prices, the spotlight gets turned on to uh, immigration and population mm -hmm. growth. Now, I know um, you've previously done some work with uh, Sustainable Australia. Um, yep. I think um, a bit like what you were saying with the rental market, though, we basically saw immigration stop for a couple of years um, and then we've sort of seen a snap back. So we're probably not seeing uh, the real picture right now and it'll probably find its own level again in time. But do you have a view for what is the uh, right level <laughs> of population growth? And also, how should migrants be chosen? Should they be picked on um, on a skills basis? Because on the one level, that makes perfect sense, bring in the people you yeah. need with the right skills. But there is another side to that equation, like all double entry bookkeeping, because um, yeah. that could result in a, a brain drain from poorer countries, um, even though they, I guess they could get some remittances down the track. So what do you think? Yeah. You know, if you were the if you were the prime minister tomorrow, uh, what would you say? What would your population policy be? Uh, that's a great question. So I guess let me first um, talk about uh, levels of immigration and the property market effects. Um, so we saw sort of 2006, 2007 immigration really ramp up um, under I think it was Kevin Rudd really got going with that big Australia thing. And we did see rents rise in the capital cities in that period, but uh, what, what we then saw was a massive construction wave in, in the capitals of apartments. And so by 2017, rents were falling. So what that says to me is that, yes, there is a shock. So economists like to think of the economy as in equilibrium and then being shocked by events and then returning to an equilibrium. And so I think that's a sort of sensible way to see immigration. You have this change in the level from you know, 80,000 to 200,000 in a year. And that's a big shock. And so rents get squeezed in those areas. You end up with those um, more incomes chasing those properties and squeezing other people out before we return to that equilibrium of people moving in with others and adjusting how many where, where their households live. And then we saw the reverse shock in COVID and now we're seeing another shock again. So I think um, the effect is is mostly um, short term and that we can adjust as a, an economy to high levels. But I think my general view on immigration as an economic policy is that everything in moderation is fine. <laughs> so people like to get upset and say, you know, if you if you don't want 200,000 immigrants, you're anti-immigration, but 200,000 is the world's highest. You know, the last decade, we made Canada look like a closed borders, <laughs> insulated country, and they were celebrated as being open and welcoming to immigrants because Australia outside of the Middle East is, has the highest number of foreign born residents in the world. So I think we need to, on the one hand, celebrate that we're so good at integrating everyone. And on the other hand, don't don't um, sort of overdo it and and generate the the the, the pushback against it, um, and so I think the sweet spot's around a hundred thousand. So that's around 0.4 percent um, growth, and that's you know 
roughly what it was in the mid 80s till 2000, you know, for nearly 20 years, uh, from the mid 80s till the mid 2000s. Uh, and I think it's, a, you know, uh, roughly a sweet spot where you don't get excessive competition in certain labor markets, you don't get um, sort of the university sector too reliant on selling citizenship rather than teaching uh, skills, uh, which also leads to a puzzle of, hey, if our unis are so great that everyone's coming to learn skills, how do we have a skills shortage? We're training more people with skills than anyone else in the world. So you can sort of see the um, sort of propaganda or, or vested interest element at the heart of it when you, when you look at those sort of things. Um, so that's my general view. And I think you're right that the brain drain from developing countries is is a big deal. And I have read a few articles about concerns of nurses and things being um, moving out of uh, you know, Malaysia and, and other countries where, you know, the, the human value that they provide as being a doctor in Malaysia compared to being a doctor in Sydney is much, much higher, right? And there's diminishing returns to the number of doctors you have uh, in a population. Um, so I, I definitely, my, my personal bias is more, focused on refugees, uh, families, and, and less on, um, you know, horse trainers, cooks, and all those other things on our skills shortage lists. Um, students are, are, are great, but, you know, you can tighten up a lot of those um, sort of sponsored work type visas and, and skills shortage type visas and, and easily get back to a, a moderate level that I think most people would be happy with. During the uh, mining boom years, um, I actually went to work in the mining industry for a while. I guess the higher population growth did make sense at that time because, I mean, within reason, you could almost um, change jobs and ask for a pay rise or get a bonus just for turning up to work sometimes. And there was <laughs> there was a genuine skill shortage at that time. Um, but I think governments do uh, somehow get addicted to the growth because, um, as you mentioned, we went through a construction boom and then we seem to keep the immigration at a high level uh, above and beyond the time when it was necessarily needed. I think uh, yeah. a skeptic might say it was just um, uh, backfilling all those units and apartments that we built around um, <laughs> Brisbane and Melbourne and Sydney. Um, I know we've discussed this elsewhere previously, and I think you articulated quite well. It's a very poorly constructed debate often immigration mm. but um as you said it's not not necessarily about a race you know we can still have a big australian population over time but we don't have to get there tomorrow and i think that's sometimes where the nuance gets completely lost um by bad faith actors in the yeah. debate um yeah let I'm me just, your, sorry let you me, sorry let me just cap off that question that point there because i've been putting some stuff out you know on social media just testing what people people's responses are and uh, during that mining boom the mid 2010s um, Australia's GDP per capita didn't grow as fast as Japan's, which is quite interesting, right? Because not only do we have a mining boom and a population boom, and we think Japan's this basket case economy, at the same time, they had a higher rate of GDP per capita growth for a decade. So I think that's a really strong example to show that, you know, there's not all these automatic free gains from this, that it's actually... Um, a big adjustment for the economy to grow by over 2% of population a year, which is what it did for a few of those years. Um, and, and a more moderate rate is much, much easier to accommodate because we don't have to put so many people on the tools just to duplicate the number of houses. So we're back to where we were on a per, you know, per capita basis. Hey, I've heard that um, point made before about Japan's GDP uh, per capita actually improving better than other countries. If that's the case and they've got a potentially a falling population, why wouldn't more people move there? Or is that more of a cultural thing? My, my suspicion is, uh, you know, I've visited Japan a few times and I have a lot of friends there. The work culture is just, uh, if, if you... Uh, not the same as Brisbane, right? It, you know, it's not the same <laughs> as uh, Brisbane. It's probably not the same as much as, as much of Europe. So if you can go somewhere there with a very different work culture where you get your long holidays, you're not expected to stay all night, it's not this... Um, sort of status and hierarchy culture, uh, I think it's it's very, very, very different for those global mobile people who uh, are skilled and can, could work anywhere. Yeah, my younger brother has lived in South Korea for the past decade. It, it's a bigger culture shock than you might think. Um, I think if you go to Seoul and you think, well, you know, it's a modern capitalist economy, but the, the culture is very different from other uh, 
developed countries and not easy to slot into. Now, Cam, I uh, read your previous book, um, Game of Mates, which um, exposed this sort of network of corruption and backhanders and bribes and all the stuff that goes on between uh, politics and housing and developers, mm -hmm. but also right across the economy, really. Um, now, you, you mentioned you've got a new book uh, coming out soon, which concerns the housing market. Um, can you give us a bit of a, a sneak preview, if you will, or a synopsis of what's to come? Yeah, okay, I can do that. But first, the book Game of Mates, we self-published with my Paul Friders, my co-author, who was my PhD D supervisor in that book was about putting out in the public a lot of the lessons I'd learned during my PhD, looking at great corruption, political favoritism that didn't really make it to academic papers or you know, anywhere. But I, we thought it was important that people could read what we'd learnt and, and sort of share in that knowledge. That's actually been republished last year as Rigged, How Networks of Mates uh, rip off everyday Australians and and um, so you can get that in all the good bookstores. So we updated and refreshed it with new data and new information uh, in September last year. So the the next book about housing is really it's about housing policy and how to comprehensively understand the housing market a, 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 as a system. It's not about uh, you know, an individual investor and how to, you know, buy and sell houses. It's about housing as a system. And the basic premise is that um, there is a fundamental uh, symmetry in property markets where if non-property owners, those that don't have their name on a title somewhere, uh, every time they win... A property owners who do have their names on titles somewhere lose. So there's this there's this one for one trade off because of this property system, and I call it the symmetry of property asset markets. And because this is um, become a social taboo to acknowledge that doing anything about housing means making property owners losers, so that non property owners can be winners. Because there's a taboo, taboo on acknowledging that, we end up with fake housing policies and what I call the housing industrial complex of researchers, think tanks, and everyone who thinks they're trying to outsmart this symmetrical nature of property markets and, and sort of, oh, if only we upzone, we can trick those property owners into flooding the market and reducing prices so that they earn less money over time. Like, oh, if only we construct the perfect tax or regulation setting, somehow the inherent incentives in the property market, uh, we, we will trick them, we'll double cross them. Uh, and so we have this huge industry of talking nonsense about housing, just absolute huge industry of, of pretending uh, to do something and, and generating fake housing policies. And, and at the end of that, you know, I talk uh, about tax tricks, financial tricks like the Housing Future Fund, um, you know, the games we play about supply and regulation. And then I look at history and I look abroad and say, when and where has there ever been a housing system where people don't complain about a shortage and don't complain about, you know, high prices? And how did those places and times get there? Uh, and so I go through a lot of that. And then I, I talk about um, how would we take the best lesson from all of those situations and push for that here, acknowledging that it's still going to bump into the symmetry of property asset markets. There's going to be winners and losers, but when the, there is a political crisis and the timing is right, why don't we get a policy that works over the line, not one of these fake policies that we keep talking about? So that's, you know, please buy my book still, but that's a synopsis of where I'm going. Uh, and I'm going to dig into a lot of different um, areas about, you know, you name it, rent control, tax settings, negative gearing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a real tour of, of the debate and what I've summary of what I've learned after 20 years participating in it. So you can check out Cam's previous book at gameofmates.com. Also, um, you write a Substack uh, blog at fresheconomicthinking.com. Also, uh, very active, um, stirring up debate on the uh, social media at 
Dr. Cam Murray on Twitter. Uh, Cam, as a final comment or insight, um, is there anything we've not covered that you'd like to talk about? What aren't we talking about that we should be? <laughs> uh, uh, look, I, I think acknowledging that that there is a symmetry here and that the, the, the difference between owners and non-owners is really the divide in housing um, and, and making a, a workable housing system. I, th I think that's important if we're going to change the debate. In terms of what, for example, you know, things I think are going to happen in the future, a little bit of crystal ball uh, about what's going to happen this year and next. We've had a little bit of a bounce in, in house prices, and I suspect that's going to surprise a lot of people on the upside. Uh, and I suspect uh, the rental growth that we're seeing from this return to the cities and the migration influx, I think by in 12 months' time, that'll have washed through and rents won't be rising. Uh, in the capitals again, that'll be a sort of what, as I said, a once-off shock, once-off adjustment to a new equilibrium, and I think that'll surprise quite a few people too. And I wouldn't exclude the possibility that we get a surprise wave of demand for new apartments and another construction boom, like we saw in sort of 2013 to 2017 in city apartments, partly because of the higher rents, partly because there's a lot of now buyer interest in owning Aussie real estate and I think we're getting more international interest again in buying real estate not only you know off the plan apartments but the whole block in terms of build to rent investors so essentially foreign investors who want to buy a whole block and own it uh, for rental so I think that could be a bit of a, a surprise in the next 12 months as well just how much apartment construction gets out of the ground I think you could well be right so uh, that's brilliant thank you so much for coming on uh, Cam and um, I'll have to get down to Brisbane at some point and uh, catch up for you, catch up with you for a drink. I've been talking about it for the last uh, five years or so, but never seemed to quite get <laughs> well, around maybe. to it. So uh, we'll have to uh, grab a coffee and talk through some more. Yeah, sounds great, Pete.